Hi everybody, Physics Ninja. Today I want to look at an exploding projectile problem. And this is kind of a combination of projectile motion and conservation of momentum. Uh, you can also solve this problem using um, the position of the center of mass and those properties. So I'm going to kind of do it two ways. First part, conservation of momentum. Second part, uh, position of the center of mass. So let's first start by thinking about the problem. So we have a projectile that has a certain mass. In this case, it's 2m. It's being launched, again, just like any projectile at some angle theta relative to the horizontal. And it's being launched at some initial velocity v0. So in the first part of the trajectory, it just travels like projectile motion. It's going to reach a maximum height. Now, once it reaches that height, boom, what we're going to have is we're going to have some kind of internal uh, explosion, and that's going to produce a force on the object. It's going to break my projectile into two pieces. One piece is going to fall straight down after that explosion, and the other piece is going to get shot out, okay, a little bit faster than it was when it arrived at the top. So the question is, how far does that second piece go? Uh, relative to maybe the case where there is no explosion, right? What is the kind of this extra little bit of distance that it goes as a result of uh, this explosion? Okay, so let's set up the equations. Let's think about the physics and how we can solve this problem. Uh, again, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Uh, consider subscribing to my channel. Comment. I'll try to get back to you as quickly as possible. All right, so let's first do the first part over here. Um, what we have is some initial velocity, and this first part is really just projectile motion. I have another video on projectile motion, so I will do this kind of quickly. Uh, you could check that out. What you want to do for any projectile motion is basically just break down our velocity into two components. Again, if my angle is theta over here, that means that the x component of that initial velocity would be v0 uh, cos of the angle theta. And this guy here would be V0 sine of the angle theta. All right, uh, the key is that once it gets to the top, uh, there's something really, really special about the top, right? We can calculate the time that it takes to go to the top by realizing that the Y component of the velocity at the top is zero, and that's super important. That's what allows us to obtain a simple expression for the time to go to the top. Um, so, one equation you would use is one of the big five equation, which looks like this, that tells me my y component of the velocity at any time. And it looks like this minus little g times time. Now, if I set vy equals to zero, it means I'm at the top. So that allows me to find the time here. All right, so if I set this guy here equals to zero, that means that uh, this guy would be uh, v0y, uh, which we just said was v0 sine theta minus little g. And this here represents a certain time. That's the time to go to the top. So at the end, my final expression, time for the top is my initial velocity in the vertical direction and divided by little g. All right, so the reason we wanna know the time to go to the top is because this will allow us to find how far we are once we're at the top. So let's start by finding this direction, or sorry, this distance. And if I go on the diagram, this would be kind of this distance right here. What is this first part? I'm gonna call this delta x, and I'm gonna call it number one for the first part, okay? Uh, for the projectile motion part. So uh, what you want now is to write down an equation, right? How would you find the distance traveled uh, by a projectile that's launched at some angle theta? Well, uh, in the x direction, it would look like the velocity in the x direction multiplied by the time. There's no acceleration in the x direction for the first part of the travel, right? Um, so the way this looks like is this is my initial velocity in the x direction. It doesn't change in the x direction for the first part of the motion and multiplied by t top. Okay, now we could substitute everything we know. So delta x1, um, uh, v naught x is my equation right here. Let's substitute that value. That's v naught cos of theta. And all of this gets multiplied by t top. t top is right here, v naught sine of theta divided by little g. All right, we can make this a little bit neater. We can group some of the terms. So it would look like this, delta x1 equals, uh, we have two v zeros, so that's v zero squared. And then we have both of these angles. So we could just write it like this. I like the right sign first, cos of theta. And we can't forget to divide this whole thing by little g by our 9.8. Okay, so we have two important equations here. We have the time to go to the top 
And we have this guy right here, right? Delta X1. All right, that is the first part of this motion. Now we want to analyze the collision part, or the part where there's an explosion, some internal force acting that breaks this projectile apart. So let's go on the next page and consider that part. Okay, so we now want to analyze the explosion part. So what we have here, it's kind of, we're really zooming into, oops, that's a little bit too thick. Uh, what we're doing is we really want to zoom into this section over here. And this is what it looks like, right? Right near the top, we basically have this uh, projectile. Uh, let me kind of just draw it like this. Oops. All right, so we have this projectile here, which is kind of this, this box. And it has a mass of 2m. And basically near the top, we know that it's traveling, it only has an x component of the velocity, and that x component is basically v0x, right? Uh, and this value we said was equal to v0 uh, cos of the angle theta, that initial angle. All right, and then what we have is we have, it's broken down into two pieces, right? We basically have this one little piece, which is going to have basically initial, or, velocity equals to zero, right? That'll be the piece of object one. And what we're gonna have is some other piece, right? The other piece is actually going to go out like this. And it's gonna look like this. It's gonna have some velocity V2. Okay, what I've told you now is that it's broken down into two even masses. So that kind of helps us. That means that the mass of this guy is M and the mass of this guy is M because we started out with a mass equals to two M. Okay, so what we have here, although there is a force uh, acting during this explosion, there has to be, right? Because we have this first piece that basically was traveling at speed V0, and then it has an initial velocity equal to zero right after the collision because it just drops straight down. Okay, so let me just kind of write this down. Drops down. Okay, so once it drops, this guy is basically only in free fall and it's simply gonna drop straight down and equal to delta x1. That'll be how far it is from where my initial launching point was. All right, what we wanna do now is we wanna first get an expression. What is the final velocity at the top of this mass m? Okay, and for that, what we're going to use is momentum. Now, the reason we can use momentum is at least we're going to look at momentum in the x direction. All right. The total momentum in the x direction before the explosion and after the explosion. Okay, so what do we have before the explosion? Uh, let me just write this. Before has to be equal to the total momentum after the explosion. Okay, because there is no external force acting on the system. There's only an internal force, which is this explosive force. Okay, so what we have before is we have a mass 2m that's traveling at some initial velocity, which is v naught cos of theta. That is my total momentum. Remember, momentum is mass times velocity. All right, now what do we have after the collision? After the collision, we have the first piece. Uh, the first piece here has a mass m. However, it's traveling at a speed which is equal to zero in the x direction, right? It has no, no velocity whatsoever. Now we have to add that to the momentum of the second piece. And the second piece here has a mass m. And what we're looking for is v2. This is really the unknown in this problem. Okay, so you can see now that we have mass on both sides. Forget about this term. This term equals to zero. What we have is a mass m and we have a mass m. That's it. And now we simply rearrange this equation because we want to find what is this value V2. So you should see from this equation that V2 is simply going to be equal to twice the velocity in the x direction of the incoming projectile. All right, super important right here. So notice that it's actually going to speed up, right? There was a explosion. Part of it is going to have zero velocity in the x direction. The other part has to have twice the velocity in the x direction in order to conserve momentum, okay? And again, the important thing is you have conservation because there's no external force here in the x direction on the system. All right, now let's reanalyze the system now. And what we're going to do is this is going to be our starting point, And we want to find how far does the blue line go, right? We want to find this range over here. Okay, and we're gonna analyze the motion from this point all the way to where it strikes the ground.
All right, so now the last part we want to find, we have a projectile at the top, right? Only the second part here that's traveling at some initial velocity V2. And I want to find how far does it go? Again, relative to this point, right? Relative to the point of the impact. I'm calling this delta X2. So this is a simple projectile problem again. Uh, what it is, is if you're looking for how far something goes, you simply have to know its velocity, which is V2, right? It's going to be V2 in the X everywhere and multiplied by how much time, right? What is the time between this point and our final point down over here? Um, now you should be able to convince yourself that the amount of time it takes to go to the top should still be equal to the amount of time it takes to go to the bottom, okay? So V2, this is still multiplied by T top. All right, we can substitute our values now. V2 uh, is what we have over here, what we just solved for. Uh, v naught cos of the angle theta. And T top, T top was V naught sine of the angle theta divided by little g. Okay, uh, let's evaluate everything here. Just kind of group some of the terms. So we have two, we have V naught squared, sine of theta, cos theta, and all of this gets divided by little g. Now the important thing about this equation is that this is relative to the maximum, right? Relative to this position right here, right? That's all this is, delta x2. So let's look at each projectile, right? So if we call this projectile one uh, versus projectile number two, okay? Uh, for number one, uh, the range of that projectile, how far it goes is simply, its range, let's call it r1, is simply delta x1. Okay, and that's what we previously found. Uh, that was V naught squared, uh, sine theta, cos theta, uh, divided by a little g. Uh, this is exactly half the range of if there was no explosion, right? No explosion, this is how far it goes. Okay, so actually the range for object one is actually uh, the range with no explosion. Uh, divided by little two, or sorry, divided by two. Okay, how about number two? How far does number two go from the origin? Again, my origin was here. So the range for number two, uh, look what we have. We are going to have delta x1, right? That's how far it goes before the explosion. And then we have to add this delta x2, right? How far it traveled after the explosion, so notice these terms look really, really similar to each other, right? We, they both have V naught squared sine theta cos theta over little g. We just have this one here that has an extra two. So when you end up adding them all up, you get three times V zero squared uh, sine of theta cos theta divided by little g. All right, that is the range of object two. So it definitely goes a lot farther. So if there's no external force acting on the system, it means that the center of mass should follow the same trajectory as the case if there is no explosion. Okay. So that means that the position of the center of mass has to be equal to this range formula that you would find for a projectile launched at some velocity V0 and some angle theta. Okay, because there's no net force. So the center of mass kind of just follows this ideal uh, parabola. Now we have two different pieces, however, right? We had number one, which went this far, and we had number two, which went this far. So if you really wanted to evaluate how far mass number two goes, and from the origin over here, we had called this range two, what I would do is simply note that the center of mass has to be right here. This must be the position of the center of mass. And we know we have one object, which only went right here. So let's use our equation for the center of mass to try to find what uh, this position is over here. And we're gonna measure everything from um, our origin. So this is what this looks like, is you have to add all of the masses of the system multiplied by their positions. And all that gets divided by the total mass of the system. Okay, so the position of the center of mass we just said was R, I can write this like this. This must be equal to, now we have two different parts. So we have the mass M1, which is one. And what is its position? Well, right here, when it hits the ground, it's going to be at a position R over two. Again, measuring everything from my origin. Plus, there's another term, right? There's mass number two. Mass number two has a value M. 
And what we want to find is what is its range or how far did it go, right? R2 is the distance uh, from here all the way to here, right? This is the distance R2. Uh, we can't forget now to divide by the total mass of the system. That's going to be M plus M, which is 2M. All right. So let's cancel out some of these masses since they're in all of the terms. So you can get rid of those. And again, my goal here is to find what is this range R2. So bring the 2 on the other side and do a little bit of algebra. So we get 2R equals to R over 2 and plus R2. All right. Uh, bring this on the other side. Uh, what do we get? Uh, we get 2R, R2 rather, uh, equals to 2R minus R over 2. Um, that becomes uh, simply 3R over 2. And again, R here is the distance, this guy right here. Right. So if I substitute my equation, then we get that the range R2, again, it's going to be 3 times. Uh, you notice that this 2 is going to cancel with this one, so you're going to be left with 3 times V0 squared sine theta cos theta divided by little g. Okay, so we're going to get the exact same answer as we did using momentum conservation and using a little bit of kinematics if we simply use our concept of the center of mass and realizing that even though there's an explosion, there is no force in the x direction here, uh, which means that the position of the center of mass of the system must follow the ideal projectile case. It's as though there's no force acting on the center of mass, so it simply does ideal projectile. All right, thanks for watching, folks.